brand new show, uh, Forever Power 5. I'm, I'm host Nick Martino. I'm joined today by Anthony Ballister and Zan Bando. You can follow them on Twitter at Ballister555 and Zan at ZanBando99. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Nick Demart. And you can follow this show at, FP, at FP5ETB on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And you can you can follow all Empty the Bench Network shows on YouTube.com slash ETB Network. Uh, you can also find all Empty the Bench podcasts on ETBpodcast.com. And you can listen to Forever Power 5 wherever you get your podcasts. Of course, we are presented by Playback. Watching sports is more fun with others, but we spend too much of our time watching alone. Playback is a virtual space where communities can stream live sports together with everyone perfectly synced up. Creators can hop on stage, deliver their own play-by-play analysis and commentary, and invite viewers up for Q&A. Playback makes watching sports fully interactive and a social experience. From playing fantasy sports, rubbing your favorite players and teams, and watching with the commentators and communities you care about. Win or lose, sports are best enjoyed together. Join our community by going to playback.tv slash ETB Network to find out more, including our live stream schedule. All right, so college football is finally back. Uh, we just had week zero in Ireland, and you know, notably, a, 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 I would say a relatively notable week zero uh, result or matchup between Georgia Tech and Florida State. Uh, everybody right now is killing Florida State. Uh, who, if you're if you think you're having a bad week. You're having a better week than uh, Florida State or DJ Uyunglele. Uh, you're, you're having a better you're having a better week than they uh, than they are. Um, so it, I do. I, I don't know what you got your guys' reaction was on to this uh, upset. It. I think that it. Here, here's here's what I think is going to happen. I think. This will eventually blow over because college football is a very long season and a few weeks from now or a month from now or so, even like even if we're in like when we're in October, this is going to feel like ancient history, this matchup. And Florida State, I think, will bounce back from this. Uh, there's a 12 team playoff and you get an automatic bid. Of, you get an automatic bid if you win your conference. So it's not like the committee's ability to hold this over their head is not as bad as it once was. Like a year ago, this could hurt them a lot. And by the way, it wouldn't even hurt them that much because it's an August game. Uh, It was a week zero game. And losing in week zero is not quite as bad as losing in, say, you know, uh, November. Uh, It's just not quite as bad. I don't know. What were your guys' reaction to this? So I guess I'll start. Um, First off, uh, this game was awesome. Uh, Georgia Tech obviously had a lot to prove. They had a bunch of... Um, they had a bunch of star players back. They obviously had their quarterback in uh, in King, who who played decently. Oh, obviously, obviously did enough to win. And then, of course, you know that team has been on an upward trajectory uh, the, the the last couple of seasons, and had really changed the culture. You know, this program hadn't been good for probably oh, two to three decades, and, uh, and and Brent Key has done so far a really really nice job as head coach. And I would argue that. That's one of the biggest upset wins in program history. You know, they had one, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, eight or nine or so years ago against the same Florida State team. But this just had some sort of a different feel. And uh, it just goes to show that now, you, you know, you got to look at Georgia Tech as, you know, a no pushover kind of team. And I think that, you know, maybe Florida State thought, oh, we got um, DJ um, Uli Ungule coming in here. You know, he's going to essentially be a security blanket for us. You know, he has a lot of, college football experience and to see him get rattled in the way that he did. And, you know, just to see Florida state, you know, not be able to preserve, you know, the, the, the lead or, or keep the game tied uh, late in the game and give Georgia tech too many chances to win the game, I think was the most disappointing part. And, you know, you just have to look at the mental errors, the penalties, the fumbles, you know, or the, 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 the plays that turn the game around for Florida state. It was just overall like a really disappointing kind of letdown. And I'm sure that, you know, them being preseason ranked uh, prior to this game, preseason ranked number 10, it's got to feel a little bit disheartening knowing that you're going back to Tallahassee 0 and 1 instead of instead of going home to Tallahassee 1 and 0 with with the September schedule on the horizon that to me should be somewhat relatively easy, but at the same time you have to take every single game one at a time, and I feel like 
This is one of those games where Georgia Tech was being given little to no respect at all, and it went in and they showed the country that they should be taken as a legitimate uh, contender in the ACC for at least the first part of the season. You have to still remember that this is a conference that's full of, you know, a bunch of talent. You know, you, you have an NC State team that might be pretty good. You have a Clemson team that might be pretty good. You still have a Florida State team that's still going to be in the mix. You know, Notre Dame is playing a bunch of ACC power opponents. I know we don't really consider Notre Dame as an ACC team, but they're kind of a de facto one considering, you know, who they play they're in like the halfway. ACC every year. Yay. And so, I mean, just considering everything and looking at it holistically, this is, this is a huge win for Georgia Tech, and it's going to be interesting from a momentum standpoint to see where these two teams go during during the rest of the season because this was not a pushover kind of uh, kind of win for Georgia Tech, and this is a statement win, you know, that maybe tells future recruits, you know, hey, maybe I can succeed at Georgia Tech considering that they're winning on big stages. So that's what I that's what I thought about it. Yeah, I mean, games like this happen all the time. I mean, upsets like this happen pretty frequently, I would say. Pretty frequently. Uh, it, you know, it's just that this is the current thing. Like, if this had happened when there was a bunch of other games, it wouldn't have been as big of a deal. I mean, as for DJ Uyunglele, I mean, we already know what he is. I right. mean, it's not like he was supposed to be this big star. He's bounced around three different programs throughout his college career for a reason because he's really just not that good. Uh, it like he, he didn't like, the, it's not like the, it's not like DJ Uyunglele was substantially worse than he, than people expected him to be. He played kind of like what he is. He played kind of like what he is. He passed for under 200 yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions. That's really just what it was. Uh, <laughs> like he just, he just is who he is. Like, it, like everybody talking about this, Oh, this raises so many questions about DJ Uyunglele. No, it doesn't. This is exactly what he's always been, which is you know. Think, I, not, I don't. I don't think so either. You're 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 one hundred percent right. Yeah, which is just not that good. I mean, the good news is you're talking you're talking about the ACC. I mean, look, Florida ACC teams have an advantage, a clear advantage, especially under this new model with being able to win the comp with you know just automatic bids. By the way, I hate automatic bids largely for this reason. Um, I do too. With the automatic bid, if Florida State wins the ACC, they automatically get a playoff home game. Um, so this isn't going to derail. This game alone is not going to de derail their season that much. And no, ACC no, 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 but no, but what could derail their season, Nick D? And where I'm going to pause you a little bit is if Florida State maybe drops a second game, and then potentially. You know, th there's this whole debate like, oh, if you lose three games, are you 100% out? If you lose, if you lose a second game sandwiched in there somewhere, uh, I eyebrows, eyebrows are going to raise up toward Mike Norvell, and people are going to go, dude, what the heck are what the heck are you doing? You know, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, Mike Norvell. Yeah, basically, yeah, I should have said you, the only person having a worse week than DJ Uyunglele this week is Mike Norvell. Mike Norvell has to become like Amish, turn off all social media <laughs> because he's getting killed. Uh, I don't know, Anthony, what, what were your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, like I agree with a lot of the stuff you guys both uh, echoed. Um, obviously, yeah, we know DJ Ongole has had his struggles. That's why he's on, you know, his third different school. But obviously, I think what stood out to me the most is what happened in the trenches and in the line of scrimmage. Florida State coming in the season was supposed to have a dominant defensive line. They got a lot of great NFL players. Um, you got pa uh, Patrick. You also got um, Farmer on that defensive line. And it seemed like jo Georgia Tech kind of kept that defensive line in check all night. Obviously, we know Georgia Tech could run the ball. You got Haynes King, who's a dual threat. Um, so they obviously could run the ball pretty well. They got some great receivers as well in Singleton and Lane. But, man, Florida State's defensive line could not, um, you know, get to the quarterback and not, you know, really uh, put their, uh, you know, physicality on the game. Um, I do think they'll step up. You know, we've seen a lot of these times when you get an upset like this on national television, everybody talks about it. And usually that team comes up fired up in the next game. I think Mike Norvell being a great coach as he is, I think he's going to get that team fired up. And I definitely think we're going to see much improvements um, definitely next week. But, yeah, obviously, you know, they're definitely going to have a hole at quarterback. And ultimately, I think that's going to be, um, you know, the thing that uh, beats their Achilles heel this season. I mean, I think it could be a lot of teams Achilles heel this season. I mean – the truth is, you don't necessarily – it's not like in the NFL 
where you have to have this star quarterback. Like in the NFL, quarterbacks are getting like teams just throwing money at quarterbacks who are who haven't even proven anything in their careers, who are like halfway decent. You can win a national championship in college football with a quarterback whose name you forget about in 10 years. Like you don't have to necessarily have an amazing starting quarterback, but it still is the most important position, even in college football, and it can still be a big problem. It's true. I mean, speaking of quarterbacks that people probably forgot about, and I'm sure, you know, there are names that you guys are thinking of on your own off the top, but one of them that comes to mind for me is, is, uh, is, uh, a, is, uh, AJ McCarron. So, you know, who just, you know, I mean, I can think of better examples than that. I mean, like that are much more forgettable than even hit than even AJ McCarron. For, for yeah. sure. I mean, I was just more so saying because he was the first yeah. person that came to mind for me. So, yeah. Well, I was also, I mean, not even just like national championship winning quarterback. I, I mean, one that comes to mind for me is Cardell Jones. It's a good That's one. another one. That's another, it's like he one. won a national championship with Ohio State as a third. He was the third string quarterback and he won a national championship because he just got hot at the right time. And right. the next year he ended up getting benched because he was so bad. Uh, the same thing could arguably see, and, and I would agree with you too. And the same thing could arguably be said for JT Barrett, could it not? Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, th these are just teams that won. There's also a lot of teams throughout my, uh, you know, throughout my lifetime that could have won pretty easily with forgettable quarterbacks. But, but I mean, you guys would definitely say, though, even though these guys are forgettable quarterbacks, they definitely were decent college quarterbacks and definitely made some plays to help their teams win. Yeah, now, well, yeah they absolutely did. They were decent college quarterbacks, but they weren't really big stars. But either. Is DJ like, Ongle, even a decent quarterback? I mean, if he's getting outplayed by a guy like Kane King, who he's not an NFL quarterback, but he's a decent college quarterback that's a dual threat. If he's getting outplayed by Haynes King, DJ Ongle is a middle of the quarterback just in the ACC alone. I mean, I wouldn't say he was outplayed by Haynes King. I just think Georgia Tech outplayed Florida State. They won at the line of scrimmage is really what happened. They won at the line of scrimmage, and they also got the turnovers they needed at the at the right at the right times. But so, Haynes King did add an element for the running game. He did rush for over fifty yards. DJ Ungale doesn't give you anything in terms you're of right about that. You're right about that. DJ Uyunglele is not a very good running quarter. Is not a great running quarterback. He's an okay passing quarterback. It, right. Neither one of, but like, I don't think the point I'm making is I don't think Georgia Tech won because, like, we've seen in a lot of NFL games when one quarterback plays so much better than oh, the other. No, definitely not. No, it was that, more like no, that, team effort, no, that didn't happen. No, it was a yeah, team yeah, effort. That's, yeah, that's, that's definitely not what happened. And, you know, this is going to be a tough, uh, it, it, it's going to be a tough year for Mike Norvell, especially given the fact that their schedule is easy enough to win the ACC. Like, all of those games against the ACC against ACC opponents are winnable for Florida State right now because right now uh, the ACC is just a, not a good conference. It's the weaker of the power now power four conferences. Um, and by the way, even with the power five conference, even when it was power five, sometimes they were the weakest. So it's a very, all their matchups are very winnable. Clemson is not what they used to be. Florida State can definitely beat Clemson. So, you know, even like they could, like I said, they could still be a playoff team. But, you know, losing any game like this against a, an opponent who is viewed to be a cupcake, uh, which is really what people would use to describe Georgia Tech, it might not be fair, but it's just often how it's viewed, it will hurt them on some level. All right, so I do want to talk about this story, uh, Deion Sanders. And, you know, I, I want to talk about his expectations as a coach and also this embargo he's putting on a columnist in Colorado for negative coverage of him. Uh the thing is, I think the problem with Deion Sanders right now is that he is still has the mindset of an athlete. And when I say the mindset of an athlete, the, the mindset of like a corner, which is what he was, a cornerback. And, right. you know, cornerbacks can be great players, but they're never really leaders. Some of them, in his case, he certainly was like, you know, corners, wide receivers, all sorts of position players. They can be cultural phenomenons in a sense. But they're never leaders, even if they're great players. That's why wide receivers are often known for being divas. Corners are often known for talking a lot of crap and being very cocky. Because they can, kind of. You can't have a quarterback that way. You can't have a quarterback who's right. just a head case. Whereas wide receivers, corners, all sorts of players are often head cases. And I think Deion Sanders right now is he hasn't gotten out of the athlete celebrity mindset. The problem is now he's a he's a coach. A coach is he's the leader of the whole program. And he's putting this embargo on this 
columnist basically saying this whole the whole Colorado team, not even just him, the whole team is not allowed to talk to this reporter because of he's critical of him. I mean, what do you think a, a columnist's job is to do? A columnist's job is to criticize. If you're a columnist and you love everything a coach is doing, especially last year, they went four and eight. I mean, you're not going to have a job for very long. Like no, it's a columnist's job to be honest. And by the way, I mean, this is Colorado. He's not in New York. Like imagine being, I, I mean, like this is like what, what Deion Sanders is going through with critics is nothing compared to what a lot of coaches go through. I mean, imagine what Aaron Boone goes through in New York. You think he wants to pick up the New York post? No, <laughs> of course not. Because coaches are supposed to be criticized by columnists. And I, I don't know if it's, because he has thin skin or if it's because he's he knows he can kind of get away with this because he's a powerful figure as a as a head coach but this is just such a bad look for Deion Sanders yeah right? and I mean oh sorry sorry no, Anthony. yeah oh, okay I was just gonna say it's someone who um it's someone who studied journalism both in undergrad and graduate school and is someone who's done a lot of writing a lot of different places uh, from a from, from from a journalistic standpoint, this is just bad business on both sides. First off, it's clear to me that Colorado wants favorable coverage. If you're a if, if you're a columnist and you're giving your subject favorable coverage, that I mean, means that you're not technically doing the full journalism that you should be doing. So, that, so that, that's 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 point number one. Point number two: the Denver Post, depending on their reporter, is what they is what they, is what they should do. If you if you are loyal to your people in the Journalism business, they will be they, they will be loyal to you. The journalism community is clearly coming to this guy's defense. And number three, these PR people should know because reporters are meant to report. They're not there to support. They're not there to be fans. That of course there's going to be negative stuff written about. There's negative stuff written about every single team every single day. Do I necessarily agree with this? that's written about the schools that I support sometimes or the schools that I've covered in the past. Yeah, I said no, but to full out to full out ban a guy from doing his jobs simply because he can't and ask questions and simply because he can't be critical of a powerful figure that that that, that quite frankly I just personally believe is overblown hype is is absolute um is is absolute astronomically bad. It's amateur hour from a from a from a PR standpoint. And I think it just goes to show that even though this is a Colorado situation, this is also an SID situation as well, because every SID should know who they're bringing in to cover their program. And, it, and, and if they feel that, you know, if they feel that, you know, okay, this is a credible reporter and they have, and they have a very good reputation, but, but the, we're gonna, but they're, but they're gonna criticize us. They, 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 they should. It's part of their, it's part of their job. The Denver Post, and I, I alluded this to somebody uh, off camera. The Denver Post is not a PR arm, and it, it's very clear that the Denver Post is going to be as is going to be as objective as they possibly can. And if this columnist feels the way that he feels, the last person that should be criticized is him. Uh, that's what yeah. I. The, that's what I think. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I um honestly, when it comes to Deion Sanders, I love his realness. Um, he's definitely straight up with every player. Definitely can't call him fake. Um, he tells you like it is, and he definitely has an aurora about him. But at the end of the day, he does got a big ego. And you got to remember, how many times in his life has he ever been criticized? He was a dominant college athlete, basically flawless, went right to the NFL, dominated at multiple positions, won a Super Bowl, first ballot Hall of Famer, and is widely recognized as the greatest quarterback of all time. So he's not used to this type of criticism. And I think after all these years of him always being the man and never really, you know, making mistakes, you know, this is a little different. He doesn't have full control. He can't go on the field and make plays for these guys. And I think a lot of times I think that's what makes him hard to handle this criticism because he knows there's only so much he could do to affect the outcome of these games. Um, I do like some of the pieces that he does have on his team. Obviously, I do love Shador Sanders, his son. In my opinion, I think he's going to be the best quarterback in college football this year. Obviously, Travis Hunter may be the best overall player. The guy's a great receiver and a great cornerback all in one player. But honestly, I don't think Colorado has the overall depth. And I, even though they're going to be improved, I don't think they have the offensive line to really, really compete and make a really run for the Big 12 championship. They'll be improved from last year. 
Um, but I only see them probably, you know, getting about six wins, being bowl eligible. And honestly, guys, I don't see Dion being at Colorado that long. I think he's going to coach his two sons this year and maybe be at Colorado one or two more years and then may go and do something else. Well, you, when you say do something else, you mean like co move on to a better job? Um, I Either a better job or go back to television or, or just quit or retire. Because honestly, I feel like once his sons move on, I don't know how competitive Colorado is really going to be. I mean, pretty much all they have is the, the the two sons and Travis Hunter. All those guys are going to be in the NFL next year. So Colorado could be a really bad team next year. And I'm not sure how long he's going to stick around without his sons and if the team's only winning three to four games after they leave. Well, I'll say Deion Sanders by himself makes the team a lot more. Uh, I would say he by himself, uh, Deion Sanders makes the team a lot more competitive. Just, I mean, just in terms of recruiting, he does. I'm looking for where they are in the recruiting class. I can't find it. They might not even be top. But 50. being such a winner that Dion is, even if they, even if he does make them better, we got to remember before Dion, Colorado was a one to two to three win team. With Dion, they're probably a four to five win team. But that's not good enough to keep Dion sticking around. If he's only winning yeah. four or five games, I don't know if he's going to stay around that long, especially if he doesn't coach his sons anymore. Except I don't yeah. think he's going to win only four or five games. I think he's going to be. I think it's going to be over that. I think that they're at least an above 500 team. I mean, I last think, year. Are you talking it, about this year or next year? I'm talking about this year. So I, no, I'm, I agree with you. They're going to win six or seven games this year. But I'm saying after that, when his sons leave, I think they're going to go back to a four or five win team. And I'm not sure how long Deion Sanders is going to stick around for that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if they'll go back to that. It's just that, like, like he, like I said, he has made the program so much more relevant and it's uh, improved recruiting so drastically. I, I'm just not convinced that that's going to happen. Yeah, um, and they're yeah, and they're pretty much. And to add to your point, Nick D, they pretty much were in every single game last year. There wasn't a there wasn't a single game where you'd where, where you where, where you'd watch Colorado, maybe minus the Oregon game and maybe one other game where you were like, "Wow, th this team was legitimately competitive for three quarters." I I want exactly. I want to point out that like it, the way college football coaches are should be judged at least not always but should be and in Deion Sanders case I think it would only be fair even though they went four and eight last year they were very good for a four and eight team especially given that how bad they were the year before they were like the Rockies were like I would say uh, the Rockies the uh the uh uh the, the Colorado the last two years ago was like what the White Sox are now in baseball right like they were a joke like they were the laughing stock of all of major college football last year and oh, uh, two, years ago, sorry, two years ago right and the year after that they were he was able to go four and uh, he was able to go four and eight which obviously is not a good record they didn't make a bowl game or anything but they played but they were but would you argue nick d that they were like three plays away from going six and six because yes, i thought you were i was just gonna say that they played six ranked teams last year five of those six were one score games now they lost five of those six games uh, except the TCU game when Deion Sanders badgers the reporter and says, do you believe now? <laughs> it's like, But how much of that had to do with the fact that you had a guy like Shador Sanders at the quarterback position and you had a guy like Travis Hunter who could play both ways of the field? I know Hunter and yeah. uh, Shador Sanders had their injuries, but those guys being on the field made the difference and made those games competitive. Those yeah, guys but, aren't being replaced. But, but the thing is, Star players leave all the time. Every couple of years in college football, and programs don't go down the tubes just because it, every time a star player leaves. And also, what I'll point out is you're, you're giving players the credit, but whatever player is on that roster is there because of the coach. Because the coach is in college football is effectively a GM and a head coach. They, they right. have two jobs in one. So the reason Travis Hunter was there is because Dion brought him there. But Travis, Travis Hunter was the number one recruit in college. Colorado, it's not for Deion Sanders. But Travis Hunter was the number one recruit coming out of high school. Any team you would have went to, he would have been a great player. It, no, I know that. But the point I'm making is that he wouldn't have been at Colorado if Deion Sanders didn't bring him there. That's, Otherwise, that, that's what I that's what I think too. Yeah. But since I mean, that recruiting guy ha, ha, has Deion Sanders recruited anybody at close to that level? Uh since other than Travis Hunter. I mean, I don't think anybody really recruits that many players at that level. Because he, he got Travis Hunter, but he hasn't really had a star player. I mean, he got McLean, the cornerback, last year, but he ended up having to transfer out. So, I mean, he hasn't really got that. He's got the one big recruit. But has Deion Sanders brought anybody else in other than Travis Hunter?
And I'm just saying, I think after Travis Hunter and those guys leave, I'm not going to be so confident in Dion being able to still succeed at Colorado. But 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 you have to remember, he's him his name attracts recruits. Players want to play for Deion Sanders. Recruits want to play for Deion Sanders. And that makes a huge difference. No, I definitely agree, but I don't think they're ever going to be a huge like recruiting powerhouse. Never going to be a top ten recruiting team. No, no, I, no. I agree. They won't no. be a top ten recruiting team. Like they, they will never compete with Alabama, Georgia, or Ohio and State. I, and also, I think what we're failing to realize too is they just transitioned from formerly either Pac twelve to the Big Twelve, which is which is which is no slouch. Like they're the, the they may have went from here to here in terms of in terms of. Who they have to play year, year in and year out. Playing Oklahoma State's not easy. Playing Kansas State's not easy. Playing TCU's not easy. Playing Hayward's not easy. Those are those are those are those are tough matchups. You, well, to be, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. I was I was basically done. Oh yeah. So basically, okay, I kind of agree, but I don't think it really makes that much of a difference because you have to remember the Pac-12 was actually. The last couple of years it was around was actually a pretty tough conference. It was the Pac-12 exactly. usually has some really good teams. And by the way, a lot of the really good teams in the Big 12, namely Oklahoma and Texas, they're not there anymore. They're in the SEC. <laughs> so I don't right. think it's – I don't really think the Big 12 is vastly different than the Pac-12 right now, just in terms of competition. I don't think that makes much of a difference. Um, but, you know, overall, I basically, if I were to summarize this whole thing, is that he has to stop thinking like an athlete and a celebrity and a lot more like a coach. And what I'll say is he has to know this. Like I know this, he knows this too. Everybody who follows sports knows this. Nobody is more scrutinized than a college football coach. Nobody's more scrutinized. They're more scrutinized than NFL coaches, basketball coaches, baseball coaches. They are scrutinized oftentimes for silly reasons. God forbid you lose a game in early September that maybe you should win. Uh, with, you know, and with a bunch of college kids, like it is way worse as a co- like you like just objectively speaking, it is far worse as right a and it, right and and it, and it goes back to it goes back to what we just talked about in the first segment here, you know, P, you know, Florida State loses one game to Georgia Tech, and every single person in in Florida State lore is thinking that is thinking that. The sun isn't that the sun isn't going to come up the next day. Yeah. The, and one, the, the, one more point I want to make to you guys before I move on. Um, one thing I would give credit to Deion Sanders. I'm not sure if you guys agree with me on this is true, but obviously there was a lot of transition with college, um, you know, conference alignments. Now, obviously, Colorado got to go and be accepted into the Big 12. Had Deion Sanders not gone to Colorado, do you think the Big 12 would have won to Colorado? Because I think Deion Sanders being there had made Colorado an attractive team for the Big 12 to want to add. And had Dion not went there, do you think Colorado would have been on the outside looking in like we see with Oregon State and Washington State? I would argue, yeah. He, I don't his, know. Name, his name alone, I uh, I, think, I think is, is partially the reason why Colorado jumped to the Big 12 as, as, easily, as easily as they did. Listen, when people, when people want to watch a non- uh, a non Sanders uh us named Colorado uh compete in the com- compete in the in the in, in one of the in, in one of the other Western conference is that I'm not that that I'm thinking of a, a, a Western conference that nobody cares about. No, no. So yeah. So speaking of college football coaches, I want to get to some of this stuff. Uh Kalen DeBoer, former Washington head coach, now the head coach of Alabama has big shoes to fill with Nick Saban leaving. Uh, I'm not an Alabama fan. Uh, I'm, not, but I'm not either. He is an Alabama fan. <laughs> I, I'm not an Alabama fan. But I'll say I think that Kalen DeBoer is going to do a great job. He is a tremendous offensive-minded head coach. Uh, he makes the best of his – he makes the most of his players uh, more than most uh, m- more than most head coaches do. I mean, it's going to be difficult. I mean, it's always difficult filling in, uh, trying to replace a head coach like Nick Saban. And I I think their defense might suffer because Nick Saban was a defensive-minded head coach. Well, DeBoer is an offensive-minded head coach. Right. Um, I would say a successful year for DeBoer this year is getting past 
the first round of the playoffs. They don't have to win the SEC uh, this year. The, I, I don't. I don't think that at all. They don't have to win the SEC, but they've got to. I would say he would be heavily scrutinized if they're not a playoff team. Uh, so I would say he has to go at least nine and I'd say he has to go at least nine and three this year, Alabama. Yeah, Nick, um, you know, you may not be the Alabama fan, but you're pretty much spot on with everything you said. Um, Kalen the board. Yeah. He's going to come in. Um, he's definitely, I think going to do a lot more offensively. Um, he gets the most out of his uh, players, particularly the quarterback position. We see him like what, uh, what he did with Michael Penix jr. And now he gets a guy like Jalen Melrose, who's super, super talented. Um, the guy is super, super physically strong. He kind of reminds me of a smaller Anthony Richardson, but um, Jalen Melrow could really throw the ball deep. His intermediate and short accuracy is a little bad, but his deep ball is really, really nice. Um, I think Kalen Labor is going to be able to get the most out of him in terms of his passing game. And one thing that really you know stood out to me is what Nick Saban was so good at is he was a great recruiter. Alabama was always up there in recruiting, and so far Kalen Labor seems to be continuing that trend. So far they got a great recruiting class coming in next year in 2025. Um, so he's definitely doing really good. Um, if you want to ask me, you know, as an Alabama fan, what I would be um, as um, considered as a successful season is exactly what you said, Nick. Um, I think nine or ten wins. And even if they lose in the first round of the playoffs, I wouldn't be mad. If they can make a 12-team playoffs in the first year after replacing what is definitely undoubtedly the greatest coach to ever coach college football, um, I think that would be a huge success for Kalen DeBoer. I do think the defense will suffer and not be as good as previous years but the offense will be better to make up for it. So I see probably a 10-win season and probably a first-round exit in the playoffs for Kalen the Boar's first season. Well, I mean, their schedule is very difficult. I mean, it, there are some teams it with is. harder schedules, but their schedule is difficult. They have to – I mean, they're playing at home against Georgia, uh, it, it, but, you know, they go on the road and they have to play Tennessee, LSU, Wisconsin. and Oklahoma. And Wisconsin. And since yeah. two out of conference, which is Wisconsin, not, I don't know. I'm not really too concerned about Wisconsin, but you never. No, know. I, I know, but obviously, obviously, going to Camp Randall in mid September is more than Mike is more than is more than likely going to be tough. Yeah, but right. I mean, I'm actually kind of surprised they're willing to go. I'm surprised Alabama's willing to go on the road against Wisconsin. Usually, they don't even play on the road. Well, no, it well, no, oh, it's a home and home because in 2025, Wisconsin comes to Tuscaloosa. Okay, so it's like so. a deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like yep. a deal that they have. Okay, I see. Y yep, yep. But yeah, yeah that Georgia game, that Georgia game. I think it's what week four. That's gonna be that's gonna be the one to circle. I I think if I think if Kalen DeBoer wins that game, I think that everybody's gonna be on the Kalen DeBoer train. And even if they lose that game, and it's a really close game, people are gonna realize that Alabama, I think, is going to be okay for the foreseeable future. Yeah, well, as long as yeah, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, as long as as long as they keep it close, and and and, and as long as they keep it entertaining, like the other classic Georgia Alabama games that have been the last six seven years, it'll 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 deliver in my in my in my I mean, opinion. To me, their their notable games are obviously at home against Georgia, then on the road again at LSU, Oklahoma, and uh, Tennessee. And to me, if they split those four games and they go two and two, that's a successful season. And all those road games are going to be difficult. And by the way, beating Georgia at home, that's just as difficult because, it, it, because Georgia's the toughest of all those games. And they is, and Georgia could have won the national championship last year. They just barely lost to Alabama in the SEC championship game. Right. Uh, so, you, you know, all of those games are going to be very tough. I mean, if DeBoer goes eight and four, loses all four of those games, that would be, that would be, that a, would be a bit of a problem. Even if he goes nine and three and loses three out of those four games, maybe they could be a playoff team and it wouldn't be a huge problem. Right. Well, yeah, I agree, guys. That Georgia game is going to be huge. And you got to remember, I know they lost in the national championship, but Alabama's kind of had, um, you know, Kirby Spartan and Georgia's number. Um, they seem to be the team that always, you know, gives them the run for their money. And, and if Alabama wins that game, I mean, how can Kirby Smart feel? I mean, you always lost to Nick Saban, and now you're going to lose to the guy who replaces Nick Saban. Um, so I think definitely the pressure is going to be on Georgia to win it. Um, I don't think Alabama um, is going to be able to beat Georgia this year. Um, I think Georgia is probably the first or second best team in college football. Right now, if you ask me my uh, you know analysis heading into the year, I think Alabama is probably the third best team in the SEC. I like Texas better, and I like Georgia better. Um, but, yeah, I think nine wins um, would be good. Um, I'm hoping for 10 because I think 10 will be what they need to sneak into the playoffs. 
Do you yeah. guys think? Do you guys think even if he, they lose two or three games, do you guys think that Alabama going to the SEC championship game and Kalen DeBoer's first year is very possible? What do you? What do you guys? What do you? What do you guys? What, what do you guys think? Well, well do, do I think it's possible? I think it's certainly possible. I don't think it's probable. I, I don't think they likely will make the national championship game. But no, no, I feel I'm like talking, no, no, I'm talking about the SEC championship game. Oh, I'm sorry, SEC championship game. Yeah, I think that's very. I think it's. Very possible, but it's going to be very difficult. I mean, the SEC is a gauntlet, and it's the best it, conference in in you know in all of college football for a reason. We didn't even speak about Ole Miss is going to be a good team this year. Um, there's just a lot of good teams in the SEC, and it's going to be tough for uh, Alabama to be the second best team this year in the conference. I think they're going to be probably closer to that third or fourth spot. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's certainly possible. I, I don't, but but it will be difficult. National championship. I don't know. I don't see it. it but it's certainly possible i mean anybody's any of those 12 teams probably or at least many of those 12 teams probably could make it um so another team i want to get to is usc lincoln riley um i think that i I think that this lincoln riley thing is proves my point about college football coaches being heavily scrutinized he is an offensive genius lincoln riley uh, he is just a tremendous offensive genius. Uh, he was at Oklahoma. Oklahoma fans are really um, – Oklahoma fans are very so – I think are still very salty about him leaving to go to USC because Oklahoma's not used to used to that having – you know, Oklahoma's a big program and they think of themselves as larger than life and everything, which they are to, to an extent. And they're not used to their coaches leaving for better jobs, better opportunities – but like Oklahoma is like supposed to be the top level opportunity for college football coaches. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, you know, Lincoln Riley's offenses are just tremendous. I mean, their defenses tend to not be great uh, to say the least, uh, right. but th- their offenses are tremendous. And uh, I really don't get all the criticism of Lincoln Riley all the time. Uh, he took over USC, which was a bit of a floundering program when he took over and, right. He uh, he turned the program around overnight. He did it overnight. Um, it reminds me, I could see, I mean, to me, a successful season for USC this year is making the playoffs. I think that's what, that, that would be a successful season uh, for USC this year. I think the schedule too, and I'm sure, I don't know if you guys know it offhand, but they have it here next to me. The schedule here actually sets them up to do that pretty well because the only real tough road game that you have to worry about in the newly minted Big Ten is going to Michigan in mid-September. If they can, if they can keep the Michigan game close and maybe win, you know, win, you know, the back half of their schedule in October and November, and, and th- this is a potential eight, eight, uh, eight, and win team just considering who they play, and they reap the benefits of and of, of potentially getting a floundering Penn State team that. Uh, would be looking past them traveling cross country to Southern California uh, three to four weeks before they play Ohio State. That's a big. That's a big deal. Well, so, Penn State, I will say, is not an easy game. That's yeah, I was so just weird. about to say that. I, I I think Penn State this year might be better than USC. But yeah, I, I agree. Lincoln Riley definitely gets a little too much criticism. I just no, think I that know. everybody knows that he's a top coach, and they expect him to make the playoffs. But I think his defense and defensive coordinators have really held their team back. They definitely made some changes and brought some guys in. I think defensively they'll be more competitive. Obviously, the Big Ten is also a gauntlet. Um, so it's going to be tough for them to, to compete this year with the Ohio States, the Oregon, and the Penn States of the world. But I think outside of those three teams, I think they could be right there with any other team in the conference. Well, yeah, I was yeah. more so, I was more so just making the general point too that you know the a, thankfully for them, they get to avoid Ohio State and Oregon in this year. But the two, but the, but the two games to circle for my overall general point would be would be the would, would be the game at Michigan and then the home game against uh against Penn State and, and you can't forget they closed with Notre Dame at the end of the year and we, you know that Notre Dame is going to be a top 10 team till the very end so it's going to be it's going to be a very very interesting season for him I just wonder you know you know USC being one of these West Coast teams coming over to the Big Ten if the if the, if the travel is just, 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 just good wing as many uh hundred uh hundreds of thousands of miles is still have to is still have to try level this year it may it might impact them in a, in, a, in a negative in a negative way that'll be that'll be interesting well I would say their notable matchups this year would be LS would be the neutral site game at LSU at right, Michigan 
yep. hosting Penn State and uh, and hosting Notre Dame. If yep. they go two and two, they're a playoff team. They're successful. Even if they lose three out of the four, they might even be able to make the playoffs. I'm not totally sure. Uh, it might be difficult, but even then they maybe could. But like I said, to me, I think Lincoln Riley, I, I think Lincoln Riley is great. I think that, like I said before, college football coaches are just over or criticized too much. And people have to understand that programs develop. And it reminds me a little bit of how, um, cause I, I think that he will be scrutinized this year if they're, if they, you know, if they make the playoffs or if they, and then lose in the first round or whatever, I think that college football coach, like you have to give them time to really develop the program. I think a per- perfect example of this is I would say seven years ago, a very common hot take we were hearing was Jim Harbaugh is overrated because, you know, it's his third year and, you know, he's still losing to Ohio State, uh, losing to his rivals. And it's like, are you not considering how – much of a joke Michigan football was before he took over. They were. <laughs> I mean, to, I by mean, the way, to have, I mean, to have Brady Hoke and Rich Rodriguez be the previous two regimes to owes you everything you need to know about how Michigan, about how bad Michigan really was. So I mean, when I say, when I say bad, this team was non competitive bad. You want to talk about how, how, how mid those Jannard Robinson and Devin Gardner teams were, those teams were really, really, really bad. Yeah. So, and not only that, but it's like that opinion has completely died out. It's extinct. No, Nobody I, thinks that anymore. <laughs> like it, it just be, and looking back on it, it just seems so silly. And and I think a similar thing could be the case with Lincoln Riley. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, so I also want to talk a little bit about Ohio State, Ryan Day and Ohio State. Um, this is I wouldn't say it's a championship or bust year. I don't think any team in the league right now is a championship or bust team at all. But this is, I would say, is the closest. And it's also, uh, if anything, a beat Michigan or bust year, I think. That's what I was going to say, too, because he's lost he's lost three times in a row, and he's been criticized for two of them. And, he, and, and it seems to me like he's starting to be labeled as the coach that just can't win the big games. He, he's, beat, he's beat every team in the Big Ten so far except Michigan. It's it's pretty it's it's pretty it's pretty astonishing. Yeah, I agree, I agree, guys. And honestly, um, you know, I don't think the criticism for Ryan Day was warranted. But if he doesn't beat Michigan this year, he deserves all the criticism he's going to get. He's got to beat Michigan this year. I mean, Michigan does not have Jim Harbaugh. I do think they're still going to be a good program, but they do have questions at quarterback. We're not sure how they're going to be offensively um, in terms of the quarterback position. They're replacing so many players. I know they're going to have a good defense, but Ohio State is stacked. I mean, look at all the players they added in the transfer portal, like Caleb Downs. Caleb Downs is an unbelievable safety. I think Will Howard's a good dual-threat quarterback. Um, you're bringing back Emeka Mbuka, a wide receiver. You got those two great edge rushers in JT and Jack Sawyer coming back. Denzel Burke. I mean, this team is stacked at almost every single position. I mean, look at their running backs. I mean, you got Travion Henderson, and you got Quinson Jukins. I mean, no team's competing with that. So this team has to, to win it this year. Um, they're going to be my preseason pick. I think they're going to win it all this year. Um, I feel like everything's going for them, and I think everything's lining up just right for them. I think they're going to be a top three defense along with a top five offense. And look out for their freshman receiver, Jeremiah Smith. He may be the best receiver that ever come out of high school. The guy's big, fast, and strong. And according to guys in Ohio State circles, he may be end up being a better player than Marvin Harrison Jr. So these, these guys, this team has a lot of great talent. And I think this team is going to probably win the national championship this year. Well, I, I'd say their their notable matchups would be at Penn State, at Oregon, and uh, at home against. Mich- Obviously, that's the biggest one at home against yep. Michigan. That that is like Ryan Day's biggest thing. And uh, you know what the thing is is that like I understand Ryan Day has big shoes to fill. You know, Urban Meyer is one of the best head coaches in college football history. He's not Nick Saban level, but he's certainly right. up there. Right. And you have to remember, but it, a lot of it is also luck. Like a lot of Urban Meyer's tenure at at Ohio State for much of that time, Michigan was a joke. I mean, he's going up against Brady Hoke and Rich Rodriguez as like they, those are their head yeah, coach. Yeah, yeah, the they rivalry. The, yeah, it wasn't even a rivalry. <laughs> right. I was gonna. I was. I was gonna say it wasn't even. It wasn't even a rivalry. And the game known as the game was the most irrelevant game in the entire country every year for like six years. So, 
Right. And not only that, but like, and, and by the way, to be fair, Urban Meyer did go up against Harbaugh the last four years of his uh, tenure, coaching right. tenure at Ohio State. But Michigan, but he had just taken over. And it does take a few years for programs to develop, especially a team like Michigan, which like like Michigan, like, like Harbaugh teams, he tends to take a while to develop those teams a little bit. And it, they have they weren't quite as good as what Ryan Day went up against. Like Ryan Day's competition against Michigan is a, is much harder than it was for Urban Meyer. It's not even really all that close. And like no, Ryan Day is not as good as Urban Meyer. Uh, that doesn't mean he's doing a bad job either. I mean, he still has really good teams. No, right. And I just want to make another general point. This is no disrespect to the schedule makers here or anything like that. Would you guys agree or disagree with me that Ohio State's first five games are an absolute joke? They're all they're all they're, they're all cupcakes. But man. I think that's another reason why they could win it all. I mean, look at Michigan the last couple of years. They had an easy start to the schedule. They were able to get get their offensive going, and now you got Chip Kelly coming in for Ohio State. He's going to be able to experiment and really figure out how to use these offensive players the first couple of weeks. So by the time they get into their hard schedule, I think they're going to be full going on you know full chemistry. Um, and yeah, I mean, on all like, cylinders. Games are a joke. They're playing. Akron, Western Michigan, and Marshall, the first three games. All home and games. They're playing, and they're playing they're, they're playing at Michigan State against a coach that's never coached in a Big Ten game. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, Michigan State is a whole other thing. Uh, but, it, look, I can only criticize Ohio State for what they can control, and you can control your own schedule. Right. Um, to be fair, they're not the only team that does it. Uh, Alabama, they play Mercer right after Thanksgiving every year. <laughs> I, I mean, like, that's just a running joke. Like, all these big SEC teams have to play teams. That, right. They basically play culinary schools in the, uh, right. in late November. At least Ohio State, they're getting them out in, they're getting them out in September. <laughs> um, right. But, yeah, you're right about that. Their schedule, I mean, they're in the – I mean, they don't they, – You got – you, do you guys see any potential trap games on this schedule? Because I don't. I really, I really, I really don't. I mean, honestly, I think the way Ohio State season is going to go, on my ass prediction, I don't think they're going to have a perfect season. I think they're going to lose to Oregon. They're still going to make the Big Ten championship. And then because of that loss, it's going to really pump them up. And then they're going to go on a run. They're going to win the Big Ten championship, maybe in a rematch against Oregon. And then they're going to go through the playoffs to win the championship with that one loss. I mean, you said I trap. could, I could, I could see that. When you say trap game, do you mean a game they might lose, or like a game, a team that? No, really no, no. Meaning, so no, no, no. So what I'm trying to say is, um, a game where they're playing a team that they could potentially be looking past. Let's say maybe against a Purdue and Northwestern and Nebraska, or something, something like something like that. Okay, um, I don't think that happens that often with Ohio State. In the trap game, it would either be Purdue or Nebraska because Nebraska's gotten much better. Uh, in terms of might might or at least might have gotten much better after hiring Matt Rule and Purdue right. always plays these teams tough, but I don't see Ohio State losing to either of those teams. I, I don't. See them uh, I don't. Them. Right. I don't think so either. I don't think so either. I was just curious because sometimes these really good teams have the one blimp in the road and lose to a team that they shouldn't. So I was just I was just, I was just curious. So yeah, but I mean, even against Penn State. With on the road, Ohio State's definitely going to be favored. They might even be favored against Oregon too on the road. Right. Um, I, I mean, any of those. I mean, but losing to Michigan, that's not a trap game. That's just Michigan's just a tough team. Right. And it also is a lot more pressure on Ryan Day now that Sharon Moore is their head coach and not Harbaugh. Jim Har not Jim Harbaugh is now the whole narrative is going to shift where it's like, okay, you better be the guy that's never been. Um, that's never been a coach at the high, uh, that's never been a head coach at the highest level of the sport. You have no excuse now. So yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I pretty think much. they have yeah. to beat Michigan this year. There, there's no excuse. I know there's a lot of luck in games, and Michigan is a talented team, but they have to. He has to win this year. There's too many yeah. questions for Michigan, and Ohio State's way too talented, especially since it's a home game. And they're, this year. And they're yeah, 100. percent And they're right. and yeah. they're at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So I do want to get to some picks. Um, over. Some I do have a list of games right here, uh, picks sure. to get to for the weekend. Uh, so Clemson, number 14, Clemson versus number one, Georgia. Uh, at my George, Georgia's giving 13 and a half. I think it is crazy to me that Clemson is the 14th ranked team. I never thought I'd see that because the committee has loved Clemson for a really long time. 
Uh, Georgia's giving 13 and a half. I like Georgia. Georgia is a tre- – they are still – I don't think they've taken much of a step back. No. I think Clemson has taken several steps back. Uh, it's a neutral site game. Look, I, I'm not sneezing at Clemson or anything, but their situation – like I said, I think Clemson has regressed a lot. Georgia has a lot to prove. I think they're bitter after losing to Alabama in that SEC championship game. So I like Georgia to be able to cover 13 and a half. It's not – I don't think it'll be a. I don't think it'll be too bad of a blowout, but I think they should be able to win by two touchdowns or more. Yeah, I mean, I like I like Georgia too, and this is no disrespect to Clemson, but Clemson just has not been the same team the last couple of years. I think that Dabu Sweeney, even though he's a very good coach, he he's kind of uh, lost his way and gotten his own ego to be in his own head a little bit, um, and. Uh, I just think that you know, as you as you alluded to, they, they were a few plays away from beating Alabama and in, in making it uh, to the college football playoff last year. And I, you know, well, I just think that every year, you know, Georgia doesn't rebuild. Georgia continues to reload, and as long as Kirby Smart is continuing to do his thing, and as long as you know Georgia, you know, is, is staying up there as one of the upper echelon teams, is the number one or number two team in the country, it should be fine. So to me, even the well, Clemson is relatively okay. We sort of said the same thing last year ahead of their game against Duke, and we all know how that one worked out, and we kind of all know how Clemson's season worked out. I think that this is this is too close for comfort. Give me Georgia by at least 17 to 21 points to win the game and cover the spread. So, Yeah, guys, uh, I think Georgia's going to win this game. Um, Carson Beck is going to be in the conversation for the best quarterback, and like you said, Georgia's not taking a step back. If anything, no. offensively, they're taking a step forward. This might be the best offense. I think Carson Beck's a better quarterback than what we saw with Stenson Bennett, as good as he was. Um, but Clemson, honestly, is going to be better than what you guys are giving him credit for. I know they struggled the last couple of years, but I think this year they could be a little bit better. I think Kate Klubnick's going to have a slight breakout year. I think he's going to show some improvement. Um, I think they're definitely going to be improved at the wide receiver position. They got a lot of young guys coming in, like T.J. Moore, um, Brian Wesco. Um, they still got Tyler Brown as well. So I like their young receivers. They're always going to be talented on defense. They got some young sophomores like Peter Woods and T.J. Parker as well, who I love. So I like their team. Um, so I'm going to go uh, Georgia in this one, but I think Georgia's only going to win by 10 points. I think Clemson's going to keep it closer, and I'm going to go Clemson with the points, but Georgia to win outright. Okay, so you like you like Clemson plus 13 okay. and a half. All right. Cool. Uh, any over under picks or anything? I'm not touching it. No. All right. Uh, um, I would say I would say the over is a chance to hit, but it'll be like very late, with like maybe seven minutes to go in the game or some or right. something okay. like that. Um, mm-hmm. USC at LSU. Uh, LSU is giving four. Uh, I think this is going to be a very close game. Uh, I like. I like USC to cover. I, I don't know. I'm not picking them to win outright either way, but I like USC to cover four points. Uh, I think that their offense, I, I think that they'll be very competitive with LS uh, with LSU. Uh, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a neutral site game. It's not, they're not. Yeah. In, 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 in Vegas, mistake, it, it's a neutral site game. Yep. In Vegas at Allegiant Stadium. They're, they're in Vegas. So yep. ignore the at. Uh, yeah, but they're, they're a neutral site game. It's a neutral site game. USC's offense is tremendous. I think they should easily be able to, I think they should be able to cover four points. Uh, I could see it being like a field goal game. Got to be careful though, because sometimes in high scoring games, which we know it will be a high scoring game, proof is oh, that it will it's, be. Yep. Uh, proof is that it's you know two offensive minded head coaches, uh, Brian Kelly and uh, and uh, Lincoln Riley. Sixty three and a half is it looks it looks a little high. I think I would take the over. I think I'll take USC to cover, and I'll take the over. Uh, in in this matchup, uh, just because I think they're going to be there's going to be a lot of just constant scoring, even though like 63 and a half is a lot. Um, but I think USC should be able to cover the three points, uh, four points. Sorry. Yeah, I like I like USC to cover, but I like LSU to win by one. I think they're going to win on some sort of game winning field goal, I think. And I actually I like the I like the under I so like I feel like 63 and a half is too many points. I feel like with it being week zero with both teams trying to get the jitters out, I don't see anything astronomical that makes me think that the score is, is gonna go over for 63 and a half. If this was if this was week six or week seven and both, both teams were undefeated and both offenses were firing in all cylinders, I would 
of the over, but I just feel like the over in week one is just way too risky in my opinion. So you like the under? Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah, guys, of, the, of the, all the games we're going to speak about, this was the toughest to pick. You got two teams with two brand new quarterbacks and Miller Moss for USC and Garrett Nussmeyer for LSU. Both guys are super, super talented. I like Nussmeyer's potential better, but I think right now in Lincoln Riley's system um, with um, Zakaria Brandt at wide receiver, I think uh, Miller Moss is probably going to be better and more efficient. Um, you know, LSU honestly struggled on, on defense as well last year, just like USC. So both, both teams got struggling defenses that got something to prove. Um, I do think LSU's defense will make slightly more plays. So uh, I'm going to go LSU here. And it's funny that Zan said by a late game field goal. Um, I see it being the same way. I think LSU is going to win a very close one by a late game field goal as well. Okay. So you like LSU to cover? So I like LSU by a field goal, but not to cover. Okay. So you like USC? Yeah. Okay. And are you touching the over under at all? No. Okay. You're not touching it. Okay. Uh, another. So here's Notre Dame at Texas A&M. Um, Texas A&M is giving three. Uh, the over-under is 46 and a half. I like Notre Dame. I like Notre Dame to win outright. Uh, I do too. This is a this is a statement game from Marcus Freeman. If they can't go into College Station and win this game, Notre Dame fans are going to be livid. That's for that's for sure because this is this is one of those seasons where I think it's a put up or shut up here for Notre Dame. It's clear that. Marcus Freeman can win nine games. He can win 10 games, but they haven't been able to get to that upper echelon, that upper threshold to make the national championship. Playing a Texas A&M team in a hostile environment, must win game, even though it's week one. Yeah, yeah. I like Notre Dame. Because here's the thing with Notre Dame. They're, this is a pre-Halloween game. Most seasons, Notre Dame is really good before Halloween, and then their season falls off the rails after Halloween. That's usually how it works with Notre Dame. I could see them going 11-1 and one this year. I mean, just to talk about Notre Dame, it's like they have a pretty easy schedule. This is they do. probably – They do. I, I, was, I, was, uh, I was looking at their schedule. This is probably the second most difficult game on their schedule, it looks like. Other I would say – well, other than USC and, the, and other than having to try to beat Florida State at home, though. That's so. true, Florida State. They have to. Okay, fine. Maybe their yeah. third toughest game. Yeah, I agree with you guys. I love Notre Dame in this. And with uh, I like Notre Dame. I think they're probably going to win by four or more. Um, Notre Dame brings a lot of talent back on defense. You got Howard Cross. Um, you got Morris in that corner. And you got Xavier Watts, who was the best safety in college football last year. Obviously, they're bringing in one of the most talented uh, college dual-threat quarterbacks in Riley Leonard. Um, if he can even get any better as a passer after carrying Duke's offense last year, um, he's going to be really successful at Notre Dame. Um, I do think Texas A&M can, can be sneaky good this year. Um, if Connor Wigman could stay healthy, I think he's a talented quarterback. The loss of running back Ruby and uh, Owens is definitely going to hurt the offense. Um, oh, Texas A&M is a good season, was... but I like, I like Notre Dame uh, as well by four or seven. Okay. Right. Uh, over under, I'm not touching. Me either. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be way too risky either way because you don't know which offense is gonna show up. So yeah, it's like these week one games, Notre Dame tends to show up for Notre Dame usually shows up for these games, these week one games. Right. It's just you don't know what type of Notre Dame offense you're gonna get though. Are you gonna get are you gonna get the one that's sluggish and kicking field goals? Or are you gonna get the one that constantly scores every single time they have the ball? So we don't know, but even I mean, there's also a question about their defense and what are we gonna get from AM? I mean, AM throughout the years has had some really bad. Has had some. But they have a real game. talented defense, though. They just got to get the most out of their players. They got so many top recruits on that defense. And honestly, it's baffling, Nick, that their defense hasn't been great with all that talent they've had. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I want to get into Penn State at West Virginia. West Virginia's giving, uh, getting, a, uh, getting eight and a half over under 51 and a half. I think Penn State is going to kill West Virginia. I do. Uh, I do. I think I do. Penn State really is going to show out. Uh, they Games like this, Penn State tends to win by pretty big margins. Yeah, and I, I feel like I've seen too many people pick West Virginia in the upset pick. They have not shown enough to me in this newer regime that, that they can even remotely hang with Penn State. I'm going to go out on the limb and say that Drew Aller has a chance to throw potentially four touchdowns in this game if he play if he play really well. And I actually am going to go out on the limb and say that they score between 45 and 56 points. This is going to be this is going to this is going to be an absolute ass kicking. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad you brought up Drew Aller. I know there's a lot of doubters out there, but I like him as a potential. Um, he's a I very like big too. guy with a strong arm. Um, he doesn't throw many interceptions. He's got to improve his accuracy. I think he will this season. 
Um, I don't really like West Virginia's defense. They got a couple good players, but not not enough to stop Penn State. Um, and you know, at Penn State now they're moving Abdul Carter to the edge. Um, he reminds me a lot of Mika Parsons. Um, he's going to be awesome this year. Um, West Virginia, though, I think their running attack is good. Um, you got Garrett Green, who's a dual threat quarterback. You got C.J. Donaldson and Jaheim White, who's a great running back duo. That would make it somewhat competitive and give them somewhat of a playing chance. But, yeah, I agree with you guys. I got Penn State all over this one, probably by 10 plus. All right. So here's one more. Miami at Florida, plus two and a half. Uh, I hate how much I love Florida this game. Uh, I hate how much I love Florida. Um, Florida is, I think that similar to Notre Dame, Florida tends to be good early in the year. And then they, they do, kind of, they do. And then they kind of fall off later in the year. I think Florida is here's what I think about Florida. They're like an average team with a really tough schedule. And it's it true. might make them look a little worse than they really are. And here's the thing. I think Florida it, this is a tough game for Miami. They're going on the road. This is sort of a rivalry game, uh, in a sense. Florida tends to be very good in these week one games. I, I think Florida, like, I, I think Florida really will win. I, I really like Florida this game. Uh, I think they'll win outright, actually. Wow. So outright. you're, you're big. What do you, what's your, um, I guess, what's your criticism of, of, uh, of of Miami as to why you think that they might trip up and, and, and lose a game that they probably shouldn't? Well, I don't think that's a ser- necessarily a criticism of Miami. Exactly. I mean, things like it's just that teams trip up and lose games that they shouldn't all the time. This this particular game just seems like it, largely because it's kind of a rivalry game, and Florida tends to be good in these games. Florida tends to be good in these week one in these week one games. Um, and they got a veteran quarterback who's been around. I know a lot of people don't like Graham Mertz, but he definitely showed some improvement last year. And I definitely think he gives Florida a chance. Florida's got talent all over that roster. But like you said, it's their schedule that's really going to hold them back. Um, but honestly, I disagree, Nick. I think this can be a close game, but I'm going to go Miami. Um, I really like Miami to shoot. I like the quarterback they're bringing in, Cam Ward. I remember his breakout season when he was at Incarnated Word. And then he transferred to Washington State. He's been a good quarterback, but I think this year he could be a great quarterback and maybe even push himself as an NFL prospect. You know, Miami's got some great receivers. They got some great defensive players. We've seen Ruben Bain, the freshman last year, jump on the scene, and I've seen NFL people saying he might be a future top pick in the draft when he's eligible. So this Miami team's got talent all over the field. Um, Florida's got talent as well. Um, they obviously have the advantage on um, being at home, but uh, I think Cam Ward's going to really break out this year. Miami's going to be a real talented team. He's definitely a huge upgrade over the quarterback they had last year and Tyler Van Dyke. So I think Miami's going to win this by three. Yeah, by the way, I also want to say this, I think, is going to be one of Miami's. I mean, Miami is a talented team, and they have a very favorable schedule. I think this is going to be one of Miami's toughest games, actually. They do. Uh, I've seen a lot of projections say that this team has a chance to go 11-1. and one. So I don't think they will. Even- I mean, okay, so I'm looking at their schedule right now. They ha- they're playing – uh, their their only ranked opponent is so far their only ranked opponent is Florida State. That's where people are seeing them they lose. So, so so even if they lose to if they lose this game and they lose to Florida State, that's a ten and two season. They yeah, could be a right. playoff team. Yeah, yeah no, no Miami. Fans by the way, Sam, we're that. talking about my criticism of Miami. I just want to get back to this for a second. I could yeah. see Mario Cristobal laying some type of blunder. That would okay. not surprise. Yeah, I mean, uh, given past history, Mario Cristobal's teams, you never, you never know. You're not, you're not wrong. So. Yeah, so you never know what might happen. He could be, he could be a little bit of a wild. We player. talked about coaches uh, being criticized, and that's another coach that if he goes out there and lays an egg, there's definitely going to be a lot of criticizing because uh, this is definitely the year that Miami definitely has a put together, and they have a lot of hope in him as a head coach. Yeah. Um, so last game, Boston College at Florida State minus seventeen. Florida State's going to kill him. Oh, this, right. is a, this, this is a get right for this is a get right, right game for Florida State. Right, it's a so, bounce back game for Florida State. Florida State coming off that embarrassing loss against Georgia Tech, uh, not to mention the fact that they're playing at home, and Boston College sticks. Boston <laughs> College is a team Florida State could easily beat up on. Yeah, I agree, guys. Um, you know, usually, like we said earlier, when you see teams that get blown out on national television. They come up pumped and ready to go, and I feel bad for Boston College. You know, I bet if Florida State would have won that game week one, 
maybe we'd actually have a competitive game and maybe this may be a slight trap game. Um, I do think, um, you know, Boston College has a decent college quarterback in Thomas Castellonis, but he's not going to be enough. And, yeah, give no. me Florida State by plus 20. Yeah, they'll, they'll win. They'll win ease. Yeah, they'll win by they'll, at least three touchdowns. I'm going to say they'll probably win like 30, like maybe 30 to 10 or something like that. It'll be, it'll yeah. be, it'll be, it'll be easy. Yeah. All right. So uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, this is, this is new. Uh, this is uh, Forever Power Five. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at, you can follow me, you can follow me on Twitter at Nick DeMart. You can follow Zan uh, at ZanBando99. You can follow Anthony at Ballister555. Uh, this was uh, Forever Power 5, and of course, we're presented by Playback, and we'll be back next week.